All right, Derek. So welcome, welcome to the Jesse Carstair show. And you are my very first guest. All right. <laughs> yeah. So I'm excited. I'm glad Kate actually connected us together yesterday. Yes. Um, and we really connected over me discussing the post I made about overweight pastors. But yes. before we dive into that, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. And then there's some things about your background that I want to specifically ask you. Yeah. Uh, name's Derek Del Rosario. And um, I don't know how deep you want me to go, but born and raised in Seaside, California, athletic background. Played a lot of tennis growing up in a single family home. My dad raised me and mom and dad divorced at an early age. Um, and we know as, you know, living in a single family home, you live in a deficit. Um, mom can't do it with the father, father can't do it with the mom, but grew up with my grandmother's house with a lot of cousins and uncles <laughs> raised by a lot of men, you know? And so with that, um, gang infested areas where I grew up in third grade. My dad introduced me to game of tennis and that kind of uh, set the path for me to, to have someone believe in me, I guess. And, and really uh, the, the talents and didn't really know I had talents and didn't want to just hang around my father. <laughs> it was just one of those things. I just wanted to be around him and uh, he'd get off at work and I'd go hang out and play, hit a few balls. And then that summer I played like all summer and, and started being pretty good at that. Was ranked throughout the juniors. Allowed me to play um, Division One tennis at San Jose State. Went on to play a little bit on the pro circuit and got injured when I was 25. Came back to Monterey. Started teaching tennis on the Monterey Peninsula, Pebble Beach. Got burned out from tennis and said, hey, I'm going to go try something new. I'm going to Vegas. And that was in 1998. My girlfriend at the time, who's my wife today, she says, well, go ahead and try it. Go do that. And uh, let me know how that goes in about six months. And so I was on the quest. Went to Vegas probably a month before that. So went out there and um, just kind of wanted to gain riches and money. And that just kind of led into some destruction of lifestyle, of stuff that I didn't have and I finally had. And and God took that away from me and then really found my passion in, in uh, 2008 when the real estate bubble busted. And I lost, we lost a lot of real estate and uh, foreclosure and homes and bankruptcy and all this stuff came about. And it was uh, just sitting in an office like this and had time on my hands. And God just said, you know, I want you to share your story. And basically, this is kind of the cliff notes of that. But this is what he wanted me to share. And I had no clue what the, how that was going to pay bills. And um, I was on a quest and I knew that he wanted to use fitness and faith. Um, as as his calling in this next season of life and um, this rededication of my life and my faith to him. Um, it was going to be not about the good old dollar. It was, was going to be about the calling that he had on my life and proclaiming his name and all that I say and do and uh, not getting uh, stirred up about the critics. And, that, and so that's been really the, the key since 2013. Our vision has stayed the same. Uh, transforming lives inside and out all around the world. We've had critics, you know, in the CrossFit world and the community when we were CrossFit. Um, we had a big community, like 50 gyms here in Vegas, and there's rarely none now, but they're like, oh, this, this faith-based thing will never last. And and so we're just here to just pedaling along and, and, uh, and just really caring about people, not their – they come in for the physical transformation, but it's more than that, the spiritual transformation that they see over time. We've had baptisms in our gym with big water troughs, horse troughs in our gym. Cool. We've had, oh, it's incredible, salvation. I mean, it's it's not just a place where, hey, we're just a Christian gym. We, we really pour in. And we have all denominations, all different walks of life, and people come in, and they know what we're about. And Little by little, the community and the people, and then they see that it's more than just the physical transformation. We use that physical as a bridge to really uh, share um, our true belief in, in, in Christ and what he's done in not just my life, all of our members and everyone mm -hmm. who's at the gym. So, um, and that's where we're at. We're at here today. You know, my, my beautiful wife uh, for 21 years now, we have three kids. 
I have um, four grandkids now, one, two, three, four grandkids now. Yeah, and so counting, it's an uh, amazing journey, amazing journey. God's just starting. It feels like I'm just starting even 10 years in our brick and mortar. And now we're just kind of uh, branching out, you know, our the 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 calling is now the uncommon human and that's you know just reaching people not to be common not to be just set in the same ways that the world wants us to kind of blend into but be set apart and so that's what the uncommon human is about um not going with the flow going up the up the stream you know and performing yeah. the common uncommonly well and that's really dear to my heart on the fitness side the faith side i just feel that that a lot of times we have this imbalance in life. Faith, we may be just very strong, but there's an imbalance on the fitness side. Someone's really fit, they may be struggling on the faith side. And so how do we bring those together? It's it's a ongoing chore, right? It doesn't does doesn't happen overnight and you never really arrive. I always say, you know, the 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 journey is much sweeter than the arrival. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, you know, it's a journey, right? Like you never mm -hmm. arrive. You know, I remember my coach growing up would say, you know, don't read your own press clippings, you know, your trophies back, yep. you know, read your news articles because that's just set you up for pride, you know, and that's the big old fall because you think you're something and you're not, you know, there's you. So that humility piece, we have four core values. Um, sorry, getting off topic, but four core values of humility. Then there's mobility and then there's endurance and love and those four things we hold our hat on you know it's very humble doing the things inside just fitness itself it's, it's very humble sharing your faith and being to proclaim it loud to others and be able to be not ashamed of it um and and, and that's a humility piece and then being mobile uh, you know mobility equals strength i i truly believe in our fitness life but so much in our spiritual life, mobility, you got to be flexible to not be set in your own ways. You know, we're, you know, one of uh, uh, the sayings at our gym on back of our shirt is get comfortable with the uncomfortable. And I think the world allow, wants us to get comfortable with the comfortable. Yeah. You know, they, they, they try to keep us in this little bubble, right? And yep. so uh, endurance is the next one. We, we run the race with endurance. It's different. A marathon runner works out different than a sprinter, right? There's a different mm -hmm. way of training and life is a marathon. And, and if you don't, you know, know how to handle the 5K, the 13 miler, the bonk at mile 20 and how to refill as you're going through this, you're just going to, you know, kind of crash and burn. And, and that doesn't, you, you don't just run a marathon and just go jump into one, you know, if you, you have to train for it. And I, I feel our life is a training session we're in training all the time learning um how to get to that finish line and, and uh, finish well and finish well and then we wrap it all in love you know how do we love others from you know that unconditional agape love that talks about in the bible not just hey i love you because you have something for me and i'm gonna you know this networking kind of love you know what i mean like yep. hey this is very good what do you do you know been a lot of those networking things but the fit to serve stems from love you know it, the the verse from fit to serve is for brethren you've been called to liberty only do not use liberty for an opportunity of the flesh but through love serve one another and fit to serve is becoming fit physically and spiritually to serve others and so that's galatians five thirteen. so that we hold our hat on fit to serve and uh there's no mirrors in our gym it's not about me. It's not about them. It's about how do we use our fitness to go out and serve the world, those unfortunate people that that mm -hmm. um, don't have legs and arms and lungs. And we, we're so blessed with what we have. And so we get to take a lot of our members out to Mexico. We have a, a nonprofit and an orphanage. We work out there and we put a fit to serve down there. So kind of getting ourselves out of our own bubble and coming back at, at, for the kids and for the adults. It's a good eye opener, you know. Those who've been outside of the country, you don't have to be on a mission trip, but you can you can see how, huh, man, uh, being an American, living for a country, and and um, it, it it's it's just a just a blessing waking up and be able to have breath and being able to do the things, and we take it for granted. And this is all things that we can do in our own strength. Um, and sometimes we just sit back and we have so many excuses, right? Oh, yeah.
sorry. So <laughs> that might be a little long winded. Uh, I don't know if I went. One of my things is like getting off topic, Derek, come back. You know, they say that in my gym all the time. Like, come back down to earth. You're, you're chasing rabbits again. Oh, don't worry. My best friend, I'm always trying to get him to land the plane when he explains <laughs> <know>. things. <laughs> but so faith and fitness, that is a vital part of my life. Yes. Any, anybody who knows me, um, I wouldn't say they go hand in hand for me because faith is always going to be that pillar number one, but mm -hmm. it's right below it. Wow. It is right below it. Because kind of how you were saying, um, it, it reminded me of Jim Rohn. He said, you know, if you don't take care of your body, it will not be able to take your mind where it wants to go. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I've, I've just always that's always resonated with me you know because our body is a temple yes. we need to treat it as so you know it is not a dumpster fire yes you know we in how we are saying we take it for granted being here in america you know food abundance access to food um we just get to have anything we want just at the push of a button you know with uber eats um, being able to door dash fast food, um, in, any of these, these items, you know, in, in my state where I live and I, I believe you're in the same one, you can do a drive through for, uh, marijuana, not yeah. saying that's good or bad, but we just have everything is just at our fingertips here in the United States. Mm. And it, it kind of, how you were saying you go to other countries, you see how some of these people live when you're doing missions makes it really hard for me personally to have empathy for people in the United States who complain about their lives. Yeah. Because I'm like, you know, we, we live in the greatest country that God's green earth has ever seen. Mm -hmm. And right. we take it for granted and people will say, well, it's all relative. And it's like, well, it's not all relative when, someone in the third world country can drink water that can poison them and they die. Yeah. It's not all relative when you live in a third world country where children as young as eight years old are literally forced into the military to m commit murder on other villages. Mm. The, all those things aren't all relative. That's right. But I mean, I'm kind of going a little bit off topic, but all those things no, kind of resonate with me when, when you bring up how we just take it for granted here in the United States. And it's kind of what, probably one of the reasons why I've been doing this podcast is to spread light to other people. And I know I'm not the only one out there who's talking about this, but I think more of us need to talk about this. Um, and one of the things that I want to start off talking about is how important it is to be a father because part of your story is you were living with a single mother mm. and you needed a father figure so much so that you were acting out and you lit your mom's couch on fire is that yeah. accurate yes that's right that's right that's right yeah yeah so let's let's dive into um from your personal experience and we can just have this conversation about like um, how important it is for to have a father figure. Wow. You know, um, you know, I, I think a lot of single family homes, I, I think the, the, the statistics is the mom raises the, 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 the kid usually in, mm -hmm. in, in my sense, it, it was my father, <clears throat> um, um, raising me. And, um, it, it, I want to fast forward a little bit because the, the beautiful thing out of what happened, um, and, and I got to live with a lot of the stuff that I dealt with, like a, a lot of the anger and a lot of things I acted out. And it wasn't until um, in my late 30s that I was able to reconcile my relationship with my mother. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember that, that conversation. We were at Discount Nutrition on Eastern Street here in Henderson. In, in Henderson. And we sat there. And well, before that, my wife was telling me, you know, you're going to have to have this conversation with your mom. And, uh, and I was prepping and I was just like, oh my gosh, this is going to go down because leading up to that birthdays and, um, just conversations were real short. I mean, to the point there, 
some sometimes I wouldn't even answer her phone calls and letters that she and cards that she would send me. So this this time was we we sat and we spent like two to three hours and just bawling, you know, in this parking lot. Of, I got to revisit this story that that that's a reenactment, right? Got to share this and and walk through some of the pain and stuff I walked through. Um, and that was like a huge weight off my back. I mean, that was huge because I know God wanted me to do that. And that was what I was dealing with all my teenage life, my young adult life, all this stuff that I was going through. I was trying to find that it was a void missing. And we, I think we go through these voids in life and, and, and we, we can clutter it with other stuff alcohol, gambling, and partying. And that was my life. That's what I did to cover all this secret stuff, this pain that I was going through, um, masking it, right? Doing all the stuff and hiding it real good. And, um, but that day was a very um, special day because from that day on, you know, now my mom lives here. We go to church together. She's a front row. We, she lives a block away from me. Great friends, right? She comes over every Sunday, me, my wife, and my mom. We pick out different movies and watch on the couch right after church. I mean, that's our Sunday routine. That's what we do. But not in a million years I would have ever thought that. I would have never, there's no way I'm going to hang out with my mom more than 10 minutes. You know what I mean? Like on the phone, one thing, not in person. And, and so seeing the reconciliation, seeing how God, the forgiveness and the power of how to forgive. And, and asking for forgiveness for those who've troubled and wronged us. It was very powerful when I had to, you know, it's great to talk about it. But as we know, as you walk through those power, those, those hard times where you have that, those hard conversations, it was hard. Um, it was very hard. And so, but it was a new chapter of me growing in who I, who God wanted me to be. And so growing up with a father being there, and just showing up, not really doing anything special, but just being there. My dad always um, was there and wanted to be there for my tennis and and showed up all the time. And I think a lot of times um, fathers just aren't there. Kids are looking around the corner at, for them to come to their baseball game, their soccer game, and look, you know, the empty promises. I'll be there, I'll be there, and they're not there. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that was the, the huge part of, of the belief in me that someone believed in me that here's a little kid that plays in his rinky dick tennis court across the street from the projects, <laughs> you know what I mean? That I walk through every day to get to, to my courts and, and someone um, believed in me. And so having a father figure growing up and then other men as well was, was huge. And that's why we have such a passion for, you know, our mentoring program <laughs> that kind of stem from, the mess that I went through, God turned into a message. I believe he turns all of our messes into a message if we're able to be transparent and vulnerable and sharing these things because we all go through things. There's a lens that we get to see through as an adult. And a lot of times we see through it from the things we've went through as a kid. Yeah. We see different things. You, you grew up yeah. and seen different things. I seen different. Sometimes we could, so we could tell a kid that, oh, I know what you're going through. But you really don't if you haven't went through what they've gone through. Yeah. And you can imagine like, oh, yeah, that's nothing. Just do this. But it's, it's different when you walk with them. And so I think a lot of our stories, um, and I think this, this is kind of going off topic, but you and I talked to the, the other day, is, is really the stories that it doesn't have to be special to anyone else out on the, the internet or social media, but it's just the things that resonate with us. And it doesn't have to be the whole world needs to like us. And yeah, I've, I've exactly. been in that boat. I've been in that boat forever. Like, they gotta like me. They got. I gotta do this to please this person. But you know, when when you have the passion for 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 one thing, like you should start putting things out for about fathers and sons. And you're like, oh, well, maybe that's my niche. Maybe that's the thing I should start yeah. doing now. I, I'll do more of that. And then you're like, oh man, that's easy to really to talk about. And I think, you know, I get that same way. It's like you, you start to look at all these people who are doing. People are following them, them, but it doesn't feel comfortable. There's a reason why it doesn't feel comfortable. It's just not like really not our story. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think all of our stories are very unique and special in, in different ways. 
And we're going to be able to touch different people, you with your story, me with my story, and then the next and the next and the next. And as we can bring the stories out in other people, I think it's powerful. Yeah. It's powerful because they, a lot of us men, we know men, we're prideful. We hold this mask. We feel good. I'm good. Look at me. I'm working out. But even when I worked out growing up, I was hiding behind them. I can go work out with the best of them. I just hide behind more weight, more running, more because I'm just drilling down the pain of what I'm going through and I'm stuffing it down. And, and it's not, you know what? I got more pain. I'm going to go train harder. And so that, 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 itself um as much as an outlet can be an idol as well in our lives right that can be something that takes precedence over um our family our kids you know uh the loved ones because we can be there but maybe we're not there and so i was you know in, in the in the life where i was we came out to vegas and, and we were raising our kids um sorry I was able to had a fortunate time to raise my my wife's. Uh, she had a five year old and seven year old, and so I've raised them since the, since they were five and seven. But they were in high school, junior high, and high school when we came out to Vegas. And uh, a lot of times I was there, but a lot of times I wasn't because I was in the scene of the real estate and partying and going out and doing all this stuff. So um, I, I I was absent a lot you know, spiritually and mentally, you know, it wasn't until that call that I got and I, I was able to turn down that real estate offer. I think it was on the thing that, that you watched the, the reenactment and, you know, it's like, Oh my gosh, we're going to finally get out of debt. I got this job offer and well, I got to pray about it. I almost got my head chopped off for doing yeah. that. Like, pray about what is six figures in this. And like, and so that was like a big pivotal piece and, and, mm. and, and start to find who I was. And so, yeah, with our kids growing up, we had lots of great times, lots of vacations, lots of time to to hang out. But, uh, you know, I, I looked at my grown up, uh, me raising the kids where it's more of a friend type. You know, I mean, I was hanging out and I was not doing all the things that I should do, but I, I was there in the home. But there was a lot of things as I looking back, I should have definitely done different. Yeah. And now being a grandfather. <laughs> I get to hang out with our, our grandkids and we do a lot of, a lot of stuff together. And so I get it all right. <clears throat> but I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think we get chances and, and times to work through these things, you know, and like you said, you see things one way as a kid. Now, how do you treat your kids? You want to do better, right? You want to treat them better. I would be, because we had lots of money at that time, I would lavish them with stuff, buying them card, buying them the best of this. And we know that that doesn't last, right? Yeah. Like that wasn't, you know, looking back like, oh my gosh, it was great at the time because you want to give the kids the best stuff, but I was giving it with just buying stuff. There weren't value of here, let's learn this lesson. Let's go on this trip together and father and son, father and daughter, you know, um, it was more of that. And, and so- do you think there was a, an aspect of, of maybe guilt when you're giving them these things? Because you said that you weren't always there, meant, like physically, maybe mentally you weren't there because you were doing the party and you were chasing the real estate money. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. that, could that have been subconscious, even if it wasn't something conscious? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Oh, yeah. Uh, my wife, we joke about it now, but it, it was kind of sad. Because, yeah, I'd go out, I'd hang out, partying with the guys and come back home and bring a Louis Vuitton back to my wife. Like, mm. Get out of jail free card. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. So she had, she had plenty of those, you know what I mean? So like, mm -hmm. so it was, <clears throat> it was one of those things. And, 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 uh, it, it, and she even went to a point of bringing them back. <laughs> and, and, and the person at Louis Vuitton goes, what are you doing? You know what mm -hmm. I mean? We joke. And, and she would tell him, no, he's not going to win me back with a purse, you know, and the yeah. girl going, no, the sales lady's going, are you kidding me? Right. So, um, so anyways, my, I was all over the place. Like, no, that's mm -hmm. not, you know, it's not right. But I didn't, I didn't get it then. Right. It was, yeah. this is how I was raised. A lot, you know, I don't blame my, uh, my, my upbringing, but when, when my dad divorced, 
my uncle and two other uncles, we and my dad, we, we all lived in one home under my grandmother's roof, and they were all single too and divorced. So they were all about going out and hanging out and partying as well in their own ways in the 70s. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like the, the disco times, right? We would spin around in my grandma's part, uh, living room and they would try to dance moves out before they go out at night. I mean, so it, this was engraved about women and partying and kind of as a child, as I look back, I, I can kind of see the steps. It makes sense. Yeah. It makes sense. Totally, right? And uh, <laughs> it was a cool thing, I guess, back then. I, it was, still is a cool thing to the world, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but but in hindsight, you, you could say that there it's there's set, definitely something missing in in that kind of lifestyle. Absolutely. Which is why they're chasing the women, why they're chasing the parties, why they're chasing that that uh instant gratification. That's right. That's and right. around their male male peers. Yes. That's right. Yeah. And like you said, it's it's just goes on generation after generation there's guys who get caught up in that i know i was caught up in that yeah. anyone who thinks that i never got caught up in that that was my thing i wasn't ever into drinking i wasn't into yep. drugs i was into women that yep. was my thing yeah um and it's one of the things of why i some of the conversations i do have whether it's online or in person uh with younger males out there who i'm trying to reach is you know, I lived that lifestyle. I don't regret anything in my life because then we're just going to kind of be holding on to that. Yes. But if I could give you advice to not follow in my footsteps, that's what I want to do because I didn't have someone giving me advice on, you know, don't be a womanizer, you know, don't idolize going out and trying to find the prettiest girl. Yes. Um, Being a man of faith, I don't know. If you've heard this, but someone close to me once told me that the most crowded place in a marriage is the bedroom Mm. because because of the past. Yes. His past and her past. Yes. And that has definitely been a struggle initially in my marriage that me and my wife had to work through a lot because Mm. she knew who I was before we were together. Yes. That's right. So, yeah, it's one of the reasons why I like to have conversations about these because guys like ourselves, it's like, okay, we lived that. Yes. Allow us to give you advice and help you walk through so you don't have to go through those. Does everyone have to learn from their own mistakes at some point? Yeah. But is there a reason why Tom Brady and Tiger Woods always had a coach? Is there a reason why Michael Jordan had Phil Knight? Or not Phil Knight, but had his coach? That's right. It, there is. There is a reason. Otherwise, there wouldn't have been a Bill Belichick. You know, there wouldn't have been these coaches of these high level performers. That's right. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I truly believe that, you know, we, I stress that point all the time with clients who come in. It's like, I'm so, such an advocate on coaching because, you know, I have a coach today. I I, I can't remember when I didn't have a coach <clears throat> from the day I, I learned tennis to playing into intercollegiate a coach professional a coach and then when i moved out to vegas i had a real estate coach um in business co- i mean so it's it i always i remember getting in the real estate and i got my license when we sold our health uh, all women's health club in 2002 i had a bad business partner and i was it was in 2000 actually 2002 we uh no 2002 um right away when i got my real estate license i hired you know mike ferry he's one of the worldwide coaches in, in real estate, but I paid a thousand bucks a month back then and a thousand dollar desk fee at our, at our um, real estate office. People thought, oh, it's crazy. They were like, dude, you don't even have a deal yet. You know what I mean? Like, why you got a, a real estate? I, I, I didn't want to learn any bad habits. I want to learn the right way and not recreate the wheel, reinvent the wheel. Right. And uh, I remember talking to my coach, he would always say, you either wait for business, buy business or go after business. In real estate, and and in Mike Fair, those who who've, who've been coached by him knows that it was very aggressive, like door knocking, called expired listings for sale by owners, were sparring on the phone, doing sales scripts, everything. But it was it was very uncomfortable for a lot of people. But it was the thing that got business. You know, what I mean? it's like yep. you're face to face, and you know, 
nowadays there's all kinds of different ways, but that was the, that was the way where you send letters out, you know? Um, but I, I, th- I think being able to walk through that discipline in, in sports, um, kind of ingrained that in me, helped, helped me with the, to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. Come, a lot of the sayings yeah. that I have in our uh, gym today, it stems from a lot of the childhood stuff that I would outwork everyone. You know, that was my mindset. Like I'm going to run home from practice. I'm going to, my dad's going to follow me in the car and I'm going to run heels and just the training aspect of how I trained. Um, I think it carries over so much, you know, with the perseverance in what we do, you know, d- playing a sport or being competitive in something, right? You, yeah. you have, you have some kind of discipline that you have a, a program, a plan every day, wake up at this time, go to bed at this time, eat this, go drill skills, play, you know, you have to organize these things. And I think, you know, a lot of times people go, well, well how do you do, you know, how do you do these things? And then what you as an athlete, you go, well, you kind of been doing it your whole life. You, there's not really, it seems like a nature. It's like, and then you forget, like some people didn't have an opportunity to do that. So when I look back, I go, when I got to Mike Ferry was able to, I was able to, this is when it really hit me that I was able to break out of, of the piece where I had all the weight of holding the resistance with my mother was I had to write down 10 things that I was grateful for in my childhood. And um, I wrote down probably, I couldn't stop it, about 300. And it's just going on and on and on. All these things is why I am today because of this happened, this happened. All these things that look bad on surface, but I was so thankful that I got, got the opportunity to walk through it. And, and, and that's really where that video testimonial eight years ago that was made, that's where uh, a teacher came to me and go, hey, you got to share this with our school. You got to share this with this other kid's parent. Hey, let me help you make a video. Let me, do, and then someone believe in you. And again, it was just like, it, it, it breeded just more energy and, and excitement. I'm like, really? Someone wants to hear that? I'm ashamed even telling that. And it, and it allowed me to be thankful of what I went through. So that visual for me of walking through that, that, that story, um, it's always a reminder. And God always tells me, you know, Look, you look at your side view mirrors at just a glance. And sometimes you want to just glance at them. You don't stare at them because you stare at them, you're going to crash. You always want to keep your, your eyes on the, win- the big windshields right in front of you. But it's good to glance back to see some of the things you've come through because it gives you fire and faith to move on. Yeah, and I totally agree that you should be thankful that you went through those things because we live in a world today where we don't want to go through adversity. We want to avoid all trauma. When a couple hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, trauma was just another day. Yes. Adversity is what our great grandparents went through and our great great grandparents went through. Adversity is how this country was founded. Adversity mm. was how what Jesus and all his disciples went through mm. being persecuted. Yes. So if we're not willing to go through adversity, how are we supposed to grow? And, any way. Mm. But today we looked at it as adversity is that we were a victim of something when really we should be looking at it as we are a piece of iron and iron sharpens iron. And that adversity is that other piece of iron. Yes. Yes. You know, it's, you know, don't ask for an easy one, ask for the strength (laughs) to go through a hard one. Yes. We have in our gym, um, our first gym here in Vegas on the wall, it said adversity causes some to break and others to break records. And it yeah. had a 12 play. You remember the record player, the 12 play record player. It had one of those. It was a circle with a needle with the record. And it said adversity causes some to break and others to break records. And because some look at adversity and go, thank you, God, for giving me this adversity. Cause I know that you chose me because I'm strong enough to make it through this. And some just crawl under a rock and go, oh, no, poor me. This is hard. This is no way. And they don't get to experience that character building from the adversity because every time we just look back, we're still alive. How, much, how many adversity stories does Jesse have in his life? 
so many, right? Like if you just go and lean on all those, like, oh my gosh. And the ones that you go, there's, I don't even know how I'd ever make it out of this one, right? We, we've said that plenty of times. If it's financial, if it's relational, yeah, how am I yeah. going to get out of this one? Oh my gosh, if I can just, and then we get out of it. And then five years later, we, we kind of forget of how God got us through that one. We're like, oh my gosh, we're not even grateful for the one he got us through. We're like, oh yeah, that happens all the time. And then this other big one is like, you could go to jail or something and he saves you from that. Yeah. You know, he saves you from not getting arrested, not getting a DUI. Not, I mean, you just go on and on and like, oh my gosh, how many times that I was able to overcome these things in my life. And these are all little nuggets and stories that um, played a big part of building us up, good, bad, and ugly, right? We have a, we, we have a story um, that's being formed and shaped. Exactly. I, I think culturally, we need to be willing to embrace those things. Because it's the opposite. We want to protect ourselves and stay away from the adversity, the trauma, um, anything negative in our lives. And I think as parents, parents will just go from the age of 37, which is how old I am, and down, we want to protect our children as best as possible. When it's actually working against us from a societal standpoint it's working against them as they're aging getting into school college out into the workplace because it's like what am i doing without my protector hmm. you know it's like yes i don't know i don't know what ethnicity you are but i'm sure it's from somewhere in central or south america based part off the filipino Del Rosa. American. Part, part filipino filipino okay yeah filipino yeah, yeah. So my mom's whole side is from Mexico. And okay. it's like they went through adversity to come here illegally yes. at some point. And they made it okay. You know, mm. I, I know I've been in the boxing industry, so I know a lot of Filipino fighters. Yes. And their stories of living in the Philippines is fucking adversity. It is like, oh, my gosh digging through trash cans to eat as a kid, but then being 15 and 14 years old and fighting professional men for not even pennies because their currency is so different than ours, yes. just to give to their parents so they could even survive. Yes. And it's like, we need to go through adversity. And, you know, it's... I know to me, it's sad that we're not willing to allow our kids to like suffer in any way, fail. We want to make, we want to idolize them and let them know that they're perfect. When more kids need to hear your story, here's where I'm kind of wrapping it all up. More kids yeah. need to hear your story, you know, going to those schools and talking to going, oh, this is okay. What I'm going to go through. Yeah. It's going to work out. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Yes. Like, I'm not the only one who's suffering something, you know, go home and my parents, they're working three, four jobs. You know, I'm having to work, you know, I'm having to watch my siblings. I'm having to do this. My dad takes me to work when I'm after, out of school. That's why I'm so tired at night because they're just trying to make it by. There's no ill will, we'll say. That's right. But it's like we need to be experiencing and willing to embrace adversity as a culture for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's totally opposite. I think in, in the schools, school districts, it's all about how comfortable, like you said, how comfortable can we be? And I got to teach at a uh, opportunity, teach several years in the, in the school district of like just CrossFit part-time as we're building out our gym and uh, teaching, teaching PE kind of CrossFit, our, our gym style of fitness. And, Wow, just seeing these, I remember getting these notes from parents of like, my kid can't work out today. They're the air in the sky. It's, they have allergies. And, you know, I mean, crazy stuff. I was like, I'd rip these, these uh, things out. Like, you're, you're walking. I'd, one time we had a, um, I would walk a mile and they'd have to be in front of me. I'd walk at a 15 minute pace. And if they got behind me, then um, they would get an F for that day. They'd, Prior to me, they never got F. It was like a slam dunk A in P, right? Like they just showed up and they would get an A. Well, you guys are going to work just like any math history. You got to turn in assignments. You're going to work. And, and, and the best thing about it, you're going to be in great shape or better shape than you were. 
And I had so many parents, man, call him, call the principal and telling the principal, like, you have some drill sergeant there. Like, I don't know what he's doing to our kids. He is like telling them they got to, to work. They, they, they're they running a mile just to warm up. And then they have a 5K at the final. And, I mean, all the, but it was laid out. Like that's six months from now. Like, don't worry. But if you, if you build upon this, you're only coming to PE two days a week. Like, I don't know who works out only two days a week. If you cannot move your body, you go sit in the casket. I mean, cause that's not good. Right. And their yeah. parents were angry. And, and when we came to the final, I remember the, the, uh, the principal, he came in one day and he's in his suit with uh, his tie and his slacks and his dress shoes and he's pouring sweat. And he came in and goes, Derek, you gave them so much time to finish this. I gave him, I think, 50 minutes for a 5K. And he just he just walked it. He walked it himself in the heat in Vegas in the summer, like June, May. And he was able to do it under the time domain. And he was, he's not in the best shape, uh, uh, the principal. And I, and he goes, yeah, you gave him way, way enough time. And so some of the parents called me after and, and thanked me because throughout the years, their, their kid, you know, were, would definitely got in better shape. They learned more about fitness. And so you got some of those, but some of them didn't want to say anything. They were kind of prideful. Um, but yeah. all in all, basically, you're going to have people that are going to going to hate on you because of what is good. No matter, you're not going to please everyone. But if you're passionate about what what's good for the person, I knew what I was doing was going to make that person better. It wasn't a drill start. It was about just doing the minimum. Like, let's walk. Yeah, and if you were to probably really dive into the nuts and bolts of how those kids were day one and at the finish, yes. the kids whose parents thanked you, I bet you their cognitive function was improved. I bet you their energy was improved. I bet you they respected their parents more That's because right. they didn't have that drain on them of lethargic. That's I right. bet you there's a handful of of benefits that those kids saw and their parents saw in them. And that's, that's right. why they're thanking you. Yes. And, and, a, and a few of the kids or a handful of kids would bring different foods to school because they'd always see me um, mm -hmm. after that, open my meals and my, my um, Tupperwares and I'd have all my meals planned out and then I'd go in the fridge and I'm like, what are you eating coach Derek? And, and they would see my chicken, brown rice, vegetables or whatever. And so they would start to, how do you make that one? And they would have different meals. So I think, you know, we, we make an impact on our youth and our next generation, good, bad, and ugly, right? Like, yep. however, you're mentoring someone right now, wherever you're at, someone's following you. Someone's we're looking at you, even if you think you're not making a difference in life. And so I was tired of, of during that season, being a bad role model of drinking and going out. And it's like, you know, I, I know I was called to do something better, that God has called me to do something better with the simple gift of you know, fitness in, in my faith. I remember uh, getting off the pro circuit at 25 and, and people would go, dude, are you going to ever get, a, you never had a W2, you never worked in your life. And that was always in my head. It's like, oh my gosh, I did, I've never worked. And so you're, you're ingrained, but like now it is like, do you have to have a W, do you have to work for someone? You know what I mean? Do you have, yeah. but our, my family, they all had, they were 20 years, 30 years, they get retirement, 401k. So this is, we go through this like system, right? So getting mm -hmm. to 25, it's like, I, I just played tennis. I taught tennis and it was fun. I, it, maybe it was $60 an hour here, $80. Here, and that was like a, just enough change to go do fun things. Um, but I think, I, I think a lot of times we, we, we give up on the things that we, we love to do and we can do those things um, and, and, and make a career out of it. <laughs> yeah exactly and make a career out of it like like there's someone that that there's a skill that you love and you want to do every single day that other people would want to know the knowledge and the wisdom and the steps that you've gone through that you just take for granted that you have you know built into your story yep no i, I agree and how you were talking about making the impact on the kid how you were eating good these kids are eating good and whether it's the good bad or the ugly you're making an impact it yes. compounds mm. and it's going to compound around their peers, your peers, any one of us, the decisions we make will compound. Yes. The guy who was 150 pounds in high school, who ended up being 240 and he's 5'8", 
it compounded. He just didn't wake up to 40 from and put on a hundred pounds. That's it right. compounds and it's going to compound on his kids. That's why that's that same dude who has chubby kids. Yes. The whole family dynamic. I bet you his buddies, he's not hanging around guys who are hammering the gym every day. That's right. So no matter which direction we go, it is compounding. And we, we often have blinders on and we don't realize that those decisions do compound and they have an impact on our kids. And if our kids don't take action to change who they are, it's going to, they're just going to follow the same footsteps. That's right. And I think, I think I was, um, I'm just, I'm diving back a little bit in the, in the pain part where I was, when I wasn't walking straight in, in my marriage and things were going sideways, I wasn't being a real good role model. I remember I would just, I was good at telling people like what to do, but I wasn't doing it myself. And I, 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 so I'm a big believer of you have to lead from the front and do be a doer. The word in James, it talks about not just a hearer only, but be a doer and walk. And so that would, that rang a, a huge bell because God told me right then. He, I, he said, I want you to just go walk the church. I don't, you know, how am I get to church? I don't have a vehicle walk. And so as I walked and you know, the story, it was six months until I invited my wife to go to church because we weren't even hanging out really in that time frame. And I go, Hey, you want to go to church? She came and everyone there is like, Hey, Derek, brother. Hey, all I wanted to do, I wanted to escape away from the pain of the world. And I wanted to be at, at that place where I felt it was home. I serve. I was in choir. I don't sing. I just wanted to do everything. Set up, tear down, men's study, whatever it was, I was there. And she would come home at six. I would just be leaving when she went to work at like eight. I'd come home about 530. She thought I was just there the whole time. But I was, God told me, don't say anything. Just don't even tell her where you went. And it was, it's funny because you can tell, but someone doesn't even have to say anything. You can tell by their continents, how they are, their demeanor, of, you know, without even saying a word. And, it, and just the things that she's seen in me, there was a change, which sparked her to even want to come with me to church, right? Like that, that happened, like you say, compounded over six months. And I was yes. looking at it. It wasn't like a time frame. Like I think in, in life, a lot of times we go, we have to do this in this six week challenge or this eight week thing. And I have to lose all this weight. It's like, dude, this is going to be a change forever. This is a longevity thing. If that's fitness, if that's your faith, if that's your marriage, it's like, just do this for you and what God's telling you to do now and let the results, ha- let him handle the results. Don't worry about the outcome of what it looks like, because we always want it yesterday, right? Like, give me it yesterday. I, I prayed for three minutes. Come on. You know what I mean? Like God's that genie, like you have to give me something today. And so like building upon that, that really set the tone of, of changing me, my heart from the inside out, truly, you know, and, and in the story, I didn't really tell this, but shortly after, as we went to church, my wife felt, found really her calling to serve in the church. We served in the youth for 10 years straight at Calvary Chapel Green Valley. And so that 10 years was like a training course for us building because her story is very similar. Growing up, single family home, <clears throat> her nephew uh, committed suicide at a young age. So she felt that God right away was calling her to pour back into these youth. And so in those 10 years of doing that, I got to learn a lot about kids and training, sharing my story. And that was just leading into Fit to Serve Fitness until we were bringing, we opened Fit to Serve Fitness. We're still serving in the youth at the church. Yeah. Yep. I think something went off. Oh, no, oh, you're good. good. Oh, okay. That was that. I had a blank screen. Oh, and then we, yeah, we started serving in, in the church. Um, and, and, and sorry, at, at, at Fit to Serve, we had a lot of youth coming. We had our youth program. So we would, I would do a Wednesday study at the church. Then Friday, we had these, these kids, like 50 kids come to our house every, every Friday night called Frontline Friday. They'd come swim. We'd do a study. And then Sunday, I'd set up another study. So I was like doing that plus full time in the gym and running our teens and kids program. And then it came to a point where it was like, 
I didn't want to leave that part, but our pastor said, yeah, you know, it's, it, God's calling you into this new season. And it was like, you, you can't reach everyone, but where you almost like you're, you're, you built into now growing into the next stage. And then that's when we went full time of, okay, now, okay, I'm going to go into fit to serve and, and, and kind of go full time in there. I felt in my spirit, it was like, oh man, am I leaving these kids? You know, we had so much fun. You build this bond with them um, over, over the time. So that was, you know, only God to be able to see that miracle happen in my marriage and for her, my wife, to be able to, for us to serve in the capacity that we got to see so many areas of life and travel and, um, the miracle, right? Like that's, it's, 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 it's amazing. So, so I'd never discount the time that was taken away where God restored it with so much more. Now, and you were pointing out that you had to lead by example and not just say, because it's like yes. anyone can give someone advice, but it doesn't right. mean that they're doing it. Yes. And it just clicks with me because in my journey of faith, because I always said I was a Christian. Mm -hmm. I even took myself maybe senior or junior year in high school. I went to church by myself just because mm -hmm. I had this calling, go to church. But in yeah. high school and in college, like I said, I wasn't, I was not living a, a Christ filled life by any means. Mm -hmm. So I always said I was a Christian. And then I meet my wife who comes from a very atheist family. And when mm -hmm. I mean very, I mean very, they would make a, com a comment like, oh, did you see Joe Biden's passing a bill where Christians can't be foster parents? So that's darn good that he's doing that about time. And you're sitting there at the dinner table and they know you're, you know, wow. deep in your faith. Wow. wow. So just painting a picture. So yes. one of a guy who I was friends with, who was a mentor um, spiritually for me, said, if you ever expect her to be a follower of Christ, be a believer, get baptized, any of this, you have to lead. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. how much she reads the Bible, comes to Bible study, goes to just church just on Sunday. You have to be the one who leads. And yes. that is going to be what has her turn into a believer yes. and devout her life. And it is, it is, I think that is true because I even tell people like, all your wife's problems are caused by you, the husband, but also can be solved by you, the husband. Other yes. than maybe her and Becky are having an argument. Yes. I'm not talking about those little things that are just, you know, grains of sand. I'm talking about she has a problem. Mm -hmm. It's your fault. You're the solution. And now my wife, if you were to ask her today with a gun to her head and said, are you a believer? I think she would just say yes. Yes. But she has gone from the most skeptical person to it wow. being her going, do you, should, are we even going to do this because you're a believer and I'm not? To where me wow. going like, yeah. Yes. And then to her, all she will put on faith-based music all by herself. I've never right. put on faith-based music. It's just That's not something right. I listen to. I don't really listen to music. She puts that on. My, she puts my kids into, uh, we homeschool them. Mm. They're in Christian based homeschool programs wow. because of her, like the, the people she starts following on social media are all faith-based people, you know? And it's like, if I wasn't leading by example, that would probably still be a huge thorn in our marriage. Amen. And she used to even say she didn't care if we got married. And I was wow. like, no, no, no. We have to get married before God in our community. Yeah. So we didn't yeah. legally get married. But yeah. I've never taken this off since we've got married, this ring, yes. for people just listening. But I know for a fact that the day that we did get married before God and then second our community, my life drastically changed. People wow. around me from when I got baptized and then married they could see that I had changed as a person and then I've seen how she has changed. Wow. wow. And you know, when you're in marriage, you're, you're supposed to be yoked. Yes. So you are moving through life together. 
And that is one of the things that we've hyper focused on. Wow. Yeah. That's so cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, um, yeah, by you leading, what a great, you know, and, and not by words of saying, but, but she sees you taking action in, in your faith over the years, right? That's, that's, that plays a huge part. Yeah. And the things that I talk about on social media, I'm not out there giving advice, trying to blow smoke up people skirts, you know, Yes. my wife, I tell her, because I'm a brutally honest person. I am. And my wife often says, I need a shirt or hat that says, sorry for my husband. You might not understand it, but he is who he is. He is true to himself. So I push her so often to, I need you to be brutally honest with me. Yes. It's like, if you feel like I'm talking about something online that I shouldn't be talking about, like you need to be the first one to come smack me and go, what the hell are you doing? Yes. You are a hypocrite. Yes. 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 Yeah. That's why I don't tell anyone how to make hundreds of millions of dollars because I have not <laughs> done that. I'm not that kind of online person. Yes. That's right. That's um, right. But yeah, it's so I often rely on her to call me out that's and then right. also, you know, prayer about is this something I can talk about or is this something I'm doing? So therefore, yeah, I should be sharing this. Yes. Yes. No, that's awesome. That's so good. Yeah, my my uh my wife is kind of like you, really brutally honest. <laughs> it's like we'll tell every like we 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 got her a shirt. It was in the CrossFit games. Uh, in the games in CrossFit, if you have if you have two work two movements together, it's called a couplet. Triplet is three workouts, and then we have four pieces together. It's called a chipper, right? So we got her the shirt and, and we put on the back chipper and it basically how she kind of, she'll call balls and strikes like right out. Like I'd always call her, man, you're so chipper, you know? And, uh, but she, 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 she calls the truth, you know, right off and, and, uh, and, and, and more of an introvert, you know, God, God knows what he's doing. He, he aligns us with the, the right companion to be able to go, navigate through life. I always say, man, if God aligned someone with just like me, would probably be in prison, you know, just jump in haywire all over the place and just like, ah, where do I go? You know, my head in the clouds, you know, and that's how I am. And she's more, I'm down to earth. I'd look at other things, Derek. You're just like, oh, this is going to be great. Everything's going to be good, you know? And then she's like, I live in reality. I'm like, this is my reality. And so we're like, totally, you know, but I'm, I'm so thankful. Because, oh my gosh, I, I, no admin skills, no, nothing of the sense of cooking and, you know, anything of house cleaning and I'm just off and going and want to talk to people, you know, give, give me people in front of me and give me, me the coach and teach them something. I love doing that. You know, those, my three spiritual gifts. Number one was faith. Then, then, then teaching and pastoring was the third one. Um, and I never understood faith. I was like, I asked my pastor when I took the faith t- uh, spiritual test and I was like, no, no, you want that. And, and then when I looked back in my, in my story, it made sense because even burning, even the bad things, even burning my mom's couch, that was like an act of faith of like getting out of there, right? Like yeah. a lot of kids would told me, they're like, dude, when are you scared and getting arrested and going to jail or juvie or like never think of, you know? I never like eat when I look at all these chapters, like me moving to Vegas at two hundred dollars and a broken Grand Am, went over the hill and stayed in the parking lot when I got that didn't show that in the in the story, but how I stayed in the cars of growing up and playing tennis. When I got my interview to go to to uh, play tennis, to there's a tennis opening, and I went there and I stayed in the parking lot in the car, and I'd done that just growing up, so I it was like. Second nature. So I got the second interview. I inter- I was showered in the country club at Club Sport here. And then I was able to do the um the test. And then second day I had to do the practical of, of coaching them on the tennis court. So I stayed in the car second night. And then from there, I had to look for a place to, to live. They said, You got the job. I had just this certificate to go, yes, you're gonna get paid on this X amount. So I go and look for a room for rent. 
in Whitney Ranch and these three college kids were living together and they had another room and I go, hey, can I stay here? But I don't have any funds. I can do your nutrition and I can do your exercise program and I get paid in two weeks. And they said, yeah, come on. Oh, <laughs> and cool. I just, out of a limb, I just, I, and the papers like went down and that was one newspaper. That's how old I am. We had newspaper, Borders mm-hmm. Books. That's where I got the Borders Books. And um, man, it's so crazy when I look back in those, these, these little nibbits, like, wow, that was only God that, but, but these faith chapters, you start to see kind of these, um, these little pieces in your life where I just like, oh, let's go do it. Who cares what happens? And my wife is like, no, no, we're not going to do that. You know? And, and there's a balance, like, yeah. obviously there's a good balance. And, and I'm, I'm glad God put me together with my wife. <laughs> oh, the, my wife and I are the, just like that. And I'm <laughs> so glad I did not marry my female twin. Oh my gosh. Uh, you know, cause yes. I'm sure there's a part of us when we're growing up where it's like, I'm like this. So I want someone like this. I didn't think I was going to marry someone with the personality that was the opposite in so many things like her. So like the house could be on fire and she's freaking out. And I'm just mm-hmm. like, but we're just going to do this. It's fine. And she's like, no, our house is burning. <laughs> and I'm just like, it's going to be okay. And it's like, but, but it's not because then after, you know, who knows where you're going to live for a while. It's right. The, you know, the process. So I guess on one hand, it's good that I stay calm, but I, she thinks of like, okay, well, the reality is we're about to be homeless. That's right. You know, right. house is on fire or during COVID I was a, 100 percent not wearing a mask anywhere i go i'm not getting it the shot i'm not mm-hmm. listening to it. it's fear and control that was just my personal opinion mm-hmm. regardless of what anyone else thinks yeah that was ours too <laughs> and if i would have had someone who was just like me as a spouse who knows what kind of trouble i would have gotten because right. she's the person who's like i don't want to get in trouble for anything ever yes what if they arrest us and I'm like, right. what, are, what do you mean? They're not going to arrest us. She's like, well, can I just wear one? You don't have to wear one because they're going to say something to us. I'd walk into Costco, not wear one. She's wearing one, just walking behind me. Or I'd be like, you're not wearing that mask. Take that off right now. And she would take it off and be like, but we're going to get in trouble. And I'm just dragging her along. She's trying to keep the peace. Yes. During yes. every where we, we would go, she would just, like, but what if they are right? It's like, I don't care. I don't care if they're right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's, we are taking the risk. We live in America. We should be, we're supposed to be a country of free men to where we get to make that choice for ourselves. That's right. And not that she didn't, not that she disagreed with me. It was the fact of her going, well, do we have to go as far overboard as you want to go? Mm. And for me, I was always, yes, that's how I'm going to, but I was like, I'm not going to make you go that far. Or when you're around your family, I'm not going to make you not wear one because her family was the opposite spectrum. They had every booster that's come out. They're probably excited for the next booster that's coming out this fall. They (laughs) still were, were, will wear masks some places. So she would just go along with whatever they said. Like if they're like, you bet you're wearing a mask out in public. She'd be like, Oh, of course, of course. Who doesn't? There's, yeah. They're in the car. That's right. You know, but there was none in my car. I was like, but yeah. I would just be like, I can't say anything because I don't want her to look bad because she just wants, she just wants to keep the peace. That's right. That's right. Um, That's yeah. so cool. So it is, yeah. there is cool, that aspect of us having to, that yin and yang or whatever it's called. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, there's that. So before we end this, I really want to, eventually i don't know how much time you have jump on the topic that really connected us on that phone call when i just happened to say yeah i made a video and people got really upset that i was bagging on really overweight pastors Mm. and i feel like that really connected you and i um yeah yeah i don't know if i will explain a little bit about my video so i made a video about how my whole the whole context was discipline and how okay. it saddens me when a pastor lacks discipline 
to just simply not be overweight. Mm. Um, when you lack discipline to not in- satisfy yourself through food, through That's consumption, right. you can't control your own addiction, which is to food. They might not have substance abuse addictions, but sugar and processed food has been proven time and time again how addictive those things are. Mm. But then you get in front of your church and to the congregation, you are preaching the word of God. And it makes me think that subconsciously they are thinking, well, he's really overweight. So it's okay if we are. Maybe not consciously, maybe no one's literally thinking that, but subconsciously, it's like, this guy's leading us. He is appointed here by God to lead however many people we are. If he can do it, we can do it. But again, I've told you, abundance of food, extremely new to humans. That's right. Um, Access to food, the amount of access that we have here in the United States, that's all new. Yep. Any other time in throughout history, other than the last three, four hundred years, because of four hundred years ago, there's outliers, you know, in England and in France, where they're taking all the food and con- the one guy's consuming it. You know, they they're controlling the food supply. But for the most part, it's extremely new. In the time of Jesus, the time of the time that the Torah was written, there was not such thing as a overweight person. Yeah. And anyone who would argue, well, they were just eating lentils. It's like, were they only eating lentils because someone had told that to me? Or were we constantly practicing discipline? Were we pra- practicing fasting? And mm-hmm. how it is in Matthew, it's like fast, but don't have a smug face. So everyone feels sorry for you because you're fasting and ev- you're making it to where everyone knows. Right. It's like, the human body is capable of so much. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today. That's right. And it just really irks me when you see a guy with a 48-inch waist who is, you know, not a professional athlete. He's not a lineman for the Cowboys who is yes. actually working out multiple times every day and trying to keep his weight up for his position. Those are the exceptions. But I have a hard problem with the rule that it's okay to be overweight, really overweight and be a pastor of a church and you're leading people. Now I will leave it at that. Yeah, man, that is, uh, you know, I, I think pastors and I, I think anything, anyone who's like on the pastoral or leadership team mm-hmm. as a, as a, as a role model, a male role model, if they're not doing anything moving towards trying to like, if they started today and, 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 they had something in plan of doing something and taking care of it. That's one thing. Yep. Um, because it could take years, you know, some people, but at least you have something that you're shooting for. But if you're just doing nothing with just the gluttony of just like getting comfortable and it's like, Oh, we're going to not be here anyways. And um, I'm going to have this glorified body when I'm in heaven. And just like having that approach, that's really the approach that you're going to look through the lens of other sins as well. Mm-hmm. You know, in, in the fruits of the spirit, you know, in Galatians, it talks about self-control, you know, not that we've mastered it, not that I've mastered it. I have a lot of problems of self-control, of eating um, stuff, right? Overeating. But I have a regimen that if I don't stay on my regimen, I, man, I'm addicted personality. I am going to eat everything in sight. And the, my wife knows I love cereal and Lucky Charms. That's not good for me. But I know that's. There's a boundary right, where I need to put up and there's seasons that I get out and go back in. And, but as long as you're doing something, just moving, walking, look at something that you're consuming because you're right. It's, I, I always say we, we all have hidden sin on, uh, that, that we deal with in life. Yep. I know I do. Yeah. We all have yeah. stuff. We're men. Man, we dip in. But when you wear it on you and you walk around with it, people first impressions a lot of things a lot to people when you when you say it's not much yeah it is when they see it you is. they hear what you say and then when you speak any word they just look at your body and so that needs to match up i believe that's a strong piece um i know our pastor 
he's working towards uh, we always have talks about he's working towards back to getting because he 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 lost a hundred and something pounds with, with with me and training and and then he the busyness of life it got up to him and he's gained some back and getting back but he knows he's aware you know like i'm going to put this back in the forefront you know um and get to it and 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 he's making steps towards that but not having a plan and and just kind of like digressing and letting your body just kind of flood away I think it's very unacceptable. I think it's it, it's hard to call people out and for other people to take you serious when they see that. You know, yep. that's my that's my what I see. You know, maybe I see it only through because I'm in fitness. But I think a lot of people, even if you're not in fitness, and you see that, I mean, people know that our country, the leading killer is food. You know, the th- one thing yep. you and I talked about is it supposed to keep us alive. Manna, food supposed to keep us alive. But it's the the leading killer in the foods that we eat. And we have a choice. Just with, like we're not robots. God gave us a choice to sin and not sin. Yep. He gave us a choice to follow him, not follow him. He didn't make us like walk around like, yes, Lord, thank you. Like these robots. He made, gave us free will, which is awesome. And there's a free will to eat whatever, right? I truly believe there's a narrative just like the, <clears throat> just like the COVID shot, just like the boosters and all this other stuff. It's just leading us down to the slaughter to kill us. They know yep. what they're doing. They've been doing yeah, yeah. it for decades. This isn't a yep. this isn't a new thing. They've been doing this for decades and killing us, but it's slowly killing us away. And we're believing this narrative. We're believing in it, and it tastes so good. Just the new donut shop that came out is just another way. Of, you know what I mean? They they yep, mask yep. it with a different different cover it's the same thing just like sin is it's this we all sin one sin's not greater than the other we just have a different wrapper on the sin right if yeah. it's pornography if it's stealing if it's it's sin yeah it's gluttony it's if it's donuts if it's hamburgers if it's eating tons of bread yeah we, we we just have to have boundaries I, I believe we have to have boundaries know what inbounds and out of bounds and then just the lack of movement, right? Like we have to have some kind of movement. If that's walking in the morning, if that's walking with your spouse, but some kind of attempt to move your body, right? They In the Bible, they were walking marathons daily, right? Yes. 26, 20 miles, 50 miles. I'm like, well, our bodies are amazing machines. They can do that. And then they re- can recover, you know? And like, but we put, our country has put us into this, like I said, get comfortable with the comfortable instead of get comfortable with the uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> they want us to get comfortable with the comfortable and say, you're great. Stay here. We'll give you money from the government. Just slash this card and you can have food come to your door and, and you get to retire and you have an ARRP card. I mean, all these comfort yeah. things. We go, wow, I can't wait to get to retirement. And what happens when those people who get to retirement? They die within years because they oh, stop yeah. moving. Everyone, right? Yep. I, my something that I love is that we are just living in quiet desperation. Oh, not you and I, but mm. as a country, the general populace, even people at church who you know, and I'm sure you would agree. I love every human. I love every person. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't mean that I have to agree or accept their lifestyle. I right. love you. Right. And if you may think I'm a dick, but mm-hmm. I am being brutally honest out of love, not to try and be derogatory towards you, not to try and put you down or make you feel bad. If you feel mm-hmm. bad, that's you decided to feel bad because of the words that I gave you. That's right. But it is always out of love. Like that's right. the past, my comment on any pastor, it's like, it is out of love for you to rep, be the best representation that you can be. I mean, you brought up uh, what Galatians in Titus, it says the men of the church should be have self-control around women. They should be men of discipline. There are yeah. so many parts of the Bible where we can look and find that being repeated over and over how we should take care of our bodies. Yes. So it's it's not like we need to nitpick one or two verses. Yes. It is in there multiple times. We only get one body, and anyone who says it's worldly, it's not worldly. That's right. It, you could say it's historically how it has been. 
fasting, fasting for multiple days. I fast for one full week every year to start the year. I go from December 31st to January 7th. Don't eat a, don't eat one single thing. I just drink water. That's great. And guess what? Nothing bad happens. Only That's good great. comes from it. That's you know right. how billing it is to fast and then pray? That's right. Yeah, absolutely. It's like and every easy. overweight pastor out there, I just challenge you, just don't eat for a week. Just pray. Mm. And think yeah. about how you can lead others, by example. That's right. Yeah, the flesh is willing, but this, uh, the, sorry, the, the, the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak, right? We mm -hmm. know that. And it says in the Bible, we know the temptation. Letting the pastors be great examples, like you said, mm -hmm. of, of just being able to walk through all parts of what they preach, right? Yeah. It, it's very important. Yeah. No, I agree. We, uh, well, Derek, let's wrap it up right here. Otherwise, we're going to go another 20 minutes on one topic. Um, I really want to do this again, though. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, Thank you for having me, man. This was awesome. Thanks for allowing me to come on and be the guest here, man. And uh, this is great. This is great. Yeah. We're going to actually owe Kate one of these days because if we uh, start killing it with some podcasts together, <laughs> yes. her for thinking of us. That's right. No, that was great. Thank you, Kate. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. That was awesome. Yeah, thank you, Kate. Um, and where can people follow you? Uh, like social Uncom media? Yeah, Instagram, Uncommon Human, Derek Del Rosario, Uncommon Human, or Derek Del Rosario, Uncommon Human on YouTube as well. Um, and what's your gym? Uh, and the, my gym is uh, Fit to Serve, the number two, Fit to Serve Fitness in Henderson, Nevada. Okay. Well, yeah. perfect. 